Uh, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here and on such a convivial occasion. Um, welcome to the Magnus. Um, my name is John Efron. I am the interim faculty director of the Magnus and the director of the Center for Jewish Studies at Berkeley. The Magnus and the Center for Jewish Studies, together with the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies, collectively provide a unique offering in Jewish studies that I'm proud to say distinguishes Berkeley from other academic Jewish studies programs anywhere in the United States. This evening, the Magnus and the Center for Jewish Studies are delighted to partner with Talby Philanthropies to present the inaugural Eva and Martin Lubitsky lecture, which will be delivered momentarily by an old friend, Fred Rosenbaum, no stranger to Berkeley. We are proud to welcome the second and third generations of the Lubitsky family, Moses and Susan Lubitsky, Moses' sister, Anne Petrovsky, her husband, Nathan Petrovsky, their children, Stacy, Sharon, and their spouses. The Magnus wishes to take this occasion to thank Moses and Susan for their loyal and ongoing support. In recent years, their support has enabled the Magnus to conserve and digitize the remarkable Roman Vishniak archive, which the photographer's daughter gifted to the Magnus in 2018. As we digitize this vol uh, voluminous collection, there are about 30,000 separate pieces, we upload images to the internet and to the monitors on our walls in the auditorium. The monitor closest to the back of the room uh, on your left features Vishniak's famous photographs capturing the daily lives of Eastern European Jewish communities in the interwar years. Some of those were taken in Lodge, Poland, where Eva and Martin Lubitsky were both born. Now to learn more about uh, Eva and Martin and to, and to introduce uh, Moses Lubitsky, I'd like to invite Shana Penn, Executive Director of Talby Philanthropies, to come up to the podium and give her introduction. Shana. Thank you, John. Good evening. On behalf of Tad Toby and Toby Philanthropies, I am delighted to see such a large and lively audience this evening for the inaugural Eva and Martin Lubitsky Memorial Lecture, presented tonight by historian and educator Fred Rosenbaum on the subject, Liberated, Not Yet Free, Jewish Survivor, Survivors in the Crucible of Post-War Europe. I'd like to start by thanking my team at Toby Philanthropies and our colleagues at the Magnus, the Center for Jewish Studies, and the University's Development and Alumni Relations for your excellent work in co-organizing this event. Thank you very much. When, when Eva Lubitsky passed, passed away in May 2021, surrounded by family in her Florida home, our country and the world at large were still in the scary, uncertain phase of the pandemic. The first vaccinations were just being made available in May, if you remember. Even during the pandemic, Eva's children, Moses and Anne, traveled regularly to Florida to visit her, and especially once she was diagnosed with COVID. After a difficult period, 97-year-old Eva recovered from COVID, the virus had taken its toll on this petite, beautiful, strong-willed woman who for many decades dedicated herself to transmitting her Holocaust experiences through in-person and virtual presentations, answering questions no matter how painful they were, visiting with school kids, gifting family photographs to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and we have a representative here tonight from the museum, Carol Stolberg, and authoring a memoir out on the ledge, out on a ledge with editor Fred Rosenbaum, which the Lubitsky family has made available for all of us tonight. And you'll find copies on a table in the lobby, so please feel, feel free to take one. 
Eva, whom I knew, and husband Martin Lubitsky, whom I regret not having known, were both born in Łódź, or the Yiddish word Lodz, for, 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 for the Polish word Łódź, the second largest Jewish community in pre-World -War, War II Poland, and the second largest ghetto that the Nazis built during their wartime occupation of Poland. Fred will discuss their lives uh, in more detail in his talk. Suffice to say here that Martin and Eva shared their Holocaust experiences with their children, and it deepened their bonds. And this is evident in how they have learned and come to understand not only how Jews died or survived in the Holocaust, but also how Jews lived in Europe, in Poland, before World War II, and to grow an appreciation for that. The, the, um, the transmission of memory from the survivor generation to the next generation has formed a family mission for the second and third generations of the Lubitskys and the Petrovskys. The devotion and dedication which led Eva, Eva, Moses and Susan, and Anne and Nathan to bring their Gansa Mishpacha to Poland, to visit Eva and Martin's childhood neighborhoods in Lodz, witness the Lodz ghetto, and journey to Auschwitz with Eva were inspirational for myself and the Toby Foundation, several of us who assisted them on their, on their family trip and got better acquainted with Eva at that time and with the family. Tad Toby, like the Lubitskys and Petrovskys, is also devoted to transmitting his family le legacy in Poland to his own offspring, as well as Ju to Jews in our community in the Bay Area and beyond. Moses and Tad are partners on many Jewish heritage projects in Poland and here in the Bay Area. After Eva's passing, Tad and I and the foundation wish, wish to honor both parents and the entire Lubitsky clan for their dedication to Jewish memory, life, and learning by establishing this annual memorial lecture. And if for a moment the Lubitskys and Petrovsky families will stand, that would be wonderful for everyone to see you. Thank you. And if there is anyone else with roots in Lodz, Poland? Raise your hand. All right, and has, who has been to Poland? Raise your hands. Great, great. So with that, I'd like to introduce Moses Lubitsky to speak about his parents, about the new collaborative project based on Eva's story and everything else that he'd like to speak about. Moses. Well, uh, thank you so much, Anna. And uh, thank you, Tad and the Talby Philanthropies for this wonderful gift. Thank you for sponsoring this lecture series uh, in honor of my parents, our parents, uh, Eva and Martin Lubitsky. And uh, you know, Shana was talking about how we all got to know each other in Poland. Uh, we got to know each other while throwing down vodka shots. <laughs> and believe me, my mother could hold her own. We had a great time. I also want to thank Fred Rosenbaum, who with my mother authored the story of her life and who is a very special friend who I've known for many years. In fact, we share something. We share half birthdays. I'll let you figure that out. All right, right, Fred? <laughs> um, uh, Fred also had a very special relationship with my mother. He spent many hours with her and with our cousin, Benice Sabatka, going to many intimate details of her life. Uh, recording her story with Fred was very, very hard for her. In fact, she quit many times. But somehow, she, as many other times in her life, she eventually managed to take a deep breath, rally herself, and move on and finish what she started. That was always important to her, was always important to my dad. Don't give up, they would always tell us. So. Shana spoke a little bit about their histories. Let me talk a little bit about their character, uh, which I believe uh, uh, paid a, a critical 
part in their ability to survive. So if I had to share, if I could, if I had to pick some characteristics that my parents shared in common, it would have been the following. It was honesty, integrity, a commitment to family first, to friends second. All very important, it meant everything to them. Compassion for others and stubbornness. When they felt they were right, they would not back off. And Fred knows this. He, when, he, when in his conversations with, uh, with my mother, he would co confront my mother with a fact that she didn't agree with. She wouldn't back down. And invariably, she proved to be right. Her memory was just impeccable. So I'll, uh, and uh, you know, so that's part of her story. Uh, without her humanity and her connections to others, she wouldn't have survived. Whether it was in the ghetto, in Auschwitz, or in the slave labor camp she ended up in, she always, was, uh, she always managed to gather a group of other young women and to form a real bond. <clears throat> a real bond. It was always one for all and all for one, and that was very important. They meant it, and they lived it. Uh, Fred tells a story in the book about how in a death march in the winter, my mother was finally ready to give up. She just couldn't go any further. Uh, she was ready to die there on the spot, but her friends would not let her. They propped her up, they warmed her body with theirs until she said, okay, she will go on, she wouldn't give up, she would carry on. So um, my mother and her friends here are pri prime example of how we as Jews don't survive as alone. We survive as a community. We depend, draw strength from one another, and that's what makes us Jewish. Now my family and I, my immediate family and I owe much to my parents. Well, whenever we might be ready to give up, they would always give us strength. They loved us and believed in us they would never, never allow us to give up on ourselves. So um, a little story that I've told many times, maybe you've heard it before, about an experience we had with a bellman in a hotel. Now, our first family trip to Poland to kind of discover our roots, we ended up in, a, in the Grand Hotel in Ludz, Woods, Ludz. And uh, we came there, we discovered that uh, we had... Uh, paid $120 a night for our room in the Grand Hotel, but our Polish driver was only being charged $5. <laughs> so uh, my father and I were engaged in a conversation with the front desk to tell him we were not just typical American schmucks. We couldn't, uh, you know, the, the price difference didn't make any sense to us. But as we were having this uh, discussion with the uh, front desk, I spotted my, wife, my mother over talking to the bellman. And remember, before we went there, uh, my mother had sworn, my mother and father both had sworn they would never again set foot on Polish soil. It was too choked, soaked with Jewish blood. This billman was a Polak, something that they really chose to not associate with. But anyway, we're arguing with the front desk, and here my mother was talking to the bellman, and I see her reach into her wallet and give him $20. As so I asked her afterwards, what was going on there? Well, she was talking to him. She, explained, she was explaining how hard life was in Poland then. They had a new baby, and they couldn't afford to buy milk. So all of a sudden, he wasn't a Polak anymore. He was another human being, and she just felt that that's what she should do. She, should, she was able to, and she could. She gave him $20 so that he could buy milk for his, for his baby. So that is... Uh, just a little example of the compassion that my mother, my father both showed to others that uh, at the end it was, it was humanity that was important to them and their humanity and the relation to others always showed through. So Fred will talk a little bit more about how that all fits into the context of our history. By the way, tomorrow I'm heading to Poland myself. Why am I heading to Poland? I was telling a few others, I was, I'm, I'm meeting Hershey Felder there, who uh, is also was enamored of my mother's story, and he is going to do his own interpretation of, my, of the book that Fred and my mother did together. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to expect. There's no script. I was told, trust the artist, so that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> the, the film will evolve, so I'm very eager to see what it's like. 
Uh, he says it'll look a little chaotic there, but it'll all come out in the editing. So we'll see. Anyway, the film is going to be broadcast. It's going to be streamed on TV. I'm not sure, um, uh, probably by the end of November, and I will see if we can send out a little notice to everybody so everybody will have an opportunity to, uh, to see the book. So stand by. Uh, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to, to now to Shana, who will introduce Fred. So thank you very much. Amazing. It gets made so quickly. Um, speaking of streaming, we are not live streaming tonight, but we are recording, and the, um, tonight's program will be available on YouTube, and we'll be sending out information about that. Before I inter now, before I introduce Fred, please, everyone, make sure that your cell phones are off. So Fred Rosenbaum is an educator and author. He founded Lair House Judaica, the Bay Area's premier school for adult Jewish education, and led it for 43 years until his retirement in 2017. You know, I remember, Fred, when I first moved out here in 1977, newly graduated from college, and having studied with Sam Castle and at Evo for Yiddish, I went to Lair House to continue to connect to Jewish education as an adult. So it was very meaningful. Fred is now on the board of the thriving new Lair House, which has been reinvented by uh, David and Rachel Bial and, and, and their friends. Fred has written 10 books, including Cosmopolitans, a social and cultural history of our community from the gold rush to the present, published by UC Press. He has also co-authored the memoirs of six Holocaust survivors, including the award-winning, best-selling, out on a ledge with the late Eva Libitsky. Please join me in welcoming Fred back to Berkeley. Boy, it's great to be back, uh, really. It's just uh, wonderful to see all of you here. I want to thank uh, Shana and her staff for the, uh, all the arrangements that have gone so well. Of course, Moses and his family for having put all this in motion. You know, it, it's an honor uh, to deliver this lecture. Now, like Shana, uh, I never had the opportunity to meet Martin Lubitsky, but I knew Eva well, Zichrona Livracha. And every time we got together, she lit up my life. I learned how, even during the darkest moments of the Shoah, she retained her humanity with unwavering loyalty to friends and devotion to family. But no less inspiring was how, afterwards, given everything she'd endured, everything she lost, Eva rebuilt her life, and it was one of uncommon vitality, a woman full of energy and laughter. And that's why I chose this topic, the beginning of that road back, the years of reentry. Now, among all the books and films about the Holocaust, only a handful focus on the period immediately after the liberation. One historian points out this deficiency by bringing up the movie Schindler's List. It closes with a Soviet officer telling the Jewish death camp inmates that they're free. In the next instant, the film portrays them 50 years later happily striding across the hills of Israel. Well, in fact, picking up the pieces of their shattered lives was a long process, fraught with bottomless grief and indelible memories of trauma, anguish facing an uncertain future. And once 
the minute by minute struggle to survive was over, then they could begin to take stock of what they'd been through, all that had been taken from them. Several have said that the day of liberation was the worst day of their life. And they soon came to feel the world had abandoned them yet again. Until 1948, Britain kept the gates of Palestine essentially closed. The United States, bending to the will of anti-Semitic congressmen and State Department officials, refused to raise its discriminatory quotas. Most of the survivors felt marooned for three to five years in DP camps in Germany and Austria, the lands of their former tormentors. Now, they could have been overcome by rage or revenge or deadening despair. Some did. But as we'll see, this prolonged hiatus, frustrating though it was, would actually be one of rejuvenation, both for the individual DPs and for the Jewish people as a whole. A revival in the heart of the former Third Reich, one of the great ironies of modern Jewish history. Now, the unlikely chain of events began in the utter chaos at war's end. The roads of Central Europe were choked with almost 10 million refugees. Ethnic Germans expelled from Poland and elsewhere. Former foreign workers released from Nazi captivity. Defeated and dazed Wehrmacht soldiers and survivors of slave labor camps and death camps, all trying to get home on foot. Their belongings piled in hand carts or baby carriages. They were referred to as the war's living wreckage. Ill-clothed, malnourished, diseased, disoriented. Now, the large majority were repatriated in just a few months. But about a million could not or would not return to their countries, truly displaced people. Most were from Poland, the Soviet Union, the Baltic nations, among them known anti-communists, Nazi collaborators, and common criminals who would face a terrible fate if they went back. Included, too, in this last million, the title of a recent work on the subject, included in this last million were about 250,000 Jews for whom repatriation was also not an option. Their homes had been seized and their possessions plundered by their Gentile neighbors, some of whom had been complicit in the Nazi atrocities. Jewish communal life had been extinguished. Family members were gone, either having fled or been killed. Most of all, Jews feared physical violence as pogroms spread across East Central Europe, taking the lives of about 1,500 Jews. Even those who took the risk of traveling home to search for loved ones were so abused that they often turned back. Seeking safety from this deadly wave of hatred, refusing to live in countries likely to be in the Soviet orbit, Jews joined this massive flight west and inundated the American and British zones of occupation. At first, this flood tide of Jewish and non-Jewish refugees was sheltered in the crudest assembly centers, sometimes in former concentration camps like Bergen-Belsen. 
They were under armed guard and behind barbed wire, enduring overcrowded and unsanitary conditions, lacking sufficient food and clothing. Some still wore their prison uniforms. Jews, thrown together with other DPs, were often subject to verbal and violent anti-Semitic attacks. The US Army, even though it had liberated multiple concentration camps, simply did not recognize the uniqueness of Jewish suffering. Many in the top brass were wary of what seemed to them like an unruly horde of miscreants who had to be cunning and amoral to have made it out alive. In that summer of 1945, the Joint Distribution Committee was late to arrive and woefully inadequate to deal with this scale of human need. UNRWA was badly understaffed and often at odds with the Army. You know, these were among the first refugee camps of the 20th century. And no country, no military, no NGO was prepared for such a humanitarian disaster. The only real help for the Jews came from sympathetic GIs, especially Jewish soldiers and officers, and above all, the roughly 100 American Jewish army chaplains who took matters into their own hands. They begged, borrowed, and stole food, clothes, medical supplies from army storehouses. They mailed letters abroad from survivors through US military postal service, the only way mail could be sent out of Germany. They searched for the few remaining books in Yiddish and for Hebrew Bibles, prayer books, other religious articles. Of course, they led services for the DPs, usually the first they had attended in years, stirring powerful emotions. One of these was held in an open field for 1,500 survivors, many of whom lacked kippot and covered their heads with the clothing they had worn under the Nazis. Let's see the first slide. The most passionate among the chaplains was young Abraham Klausner, a reform rabbi from Memphis, Tennessee. He had entered Dachau soon after its liberation by a US infantry division. Inside the barracks, a survivor called out to him, asking if he knew his brother who had long before immigrated to America and become a rabbi. Klausner answered that he not only knew him, but that he was also a US Army chaplain, and he reunited them. From then on, Klausner dropped all his official duties with the Army and devoted himself to the Sherit Hapleta, the saving remnant or saved remnant, a biblical term that he was one of the earliest to apply to the DPs. Let's look at the next slide. There you see Klausner in the center, uh, and it was sometimes called an honorary DP. Now he opened a registry of survivors, soon numbering in the tens of thousands, to facilitate contact with family members. He wrote vivid reports about the refugee crisis, sent them to Western news media, pressured government officials, the Red Cross, UNRWA, especially the JDC, to do more. His plea was blistering. In August 45, he wrote, we have received no aid from the outside world. Tomorrow morning, we shall try to release a Jew from prison because he stole a cucumber and cry for beds because our people are still sleeping on cement floors. Thank God for the cement. 
The rabbi initiated a letter writing campaign on behalf of the DPs by Jewish GIs when he had them gathered together for Yom Kippur services held in the Munich Opera House. Now because he had rebuked so many powerful organizations and had brazenly flouted army regulations, this maverick would be removed from his post in mid-1946. But Klausner's information campaign, as well as the photos and letters sent home by countless other servicemen, brought the issue to President Truman. Okay, you can remove that slide. He tapped the dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, Earl Harrison, to conduct an investigation in late summer 1945. Guided by Rabbi Klausner, Harrison was appalled at what he witnessed, and he issued a damning report made public. One frequently quoted sentence of the Hausner report was a gross exaggeration, but it reveals the depth of his indignation. He wrote, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. He implored the army to provide refugee camps exclusively for Jews with living conditions far better than the other DPs and far better than the German public. Although outside the scope of his inquiry, Harrison urged the British to immediately admit 100,000 Jewish DPs to Palestine, thus highlighting the immigration issue that would be fiercely contested in London and Washington for the rest of the 1940s. Truman, deeply moved by Harrison's report, ordered General Eisenhower to implement it. The Supreme Allied Commander had already inspected several DP camps, and he later wrote that at no other time in his life had he experienced an equal sense of shock. In one camp, he entered a makeshift synagogue on Yom Kippur and remained about half an hour visibly affected by the encounter. And so a network of 64 Jewish DP camps was created in 1945 and 46, largely in Bavaria, which you see here. including Ferenwald near Munich, the refuge for Eva and Martin Lubitsky. You see uh, in the British zone, there is Belsen. That was one of the largest ones. But the large majority are in southern Germany, particularly Bavar Bavaria. Now, after her liberation, Eva narrowly avoided rape in Prague at the hands of Soviet soldiers. And then, as she was trying to return home to Ludge to search for relatives, she heard of the pogroms and never completed the journey. With seven very close male and female friends, the surrogate family, really, for this sole survivor, sole survivor of an entire Hasidic clan. She headed west, most of the journey on foot. And she and her group reached the well-run Ferenwald, accommodating 5,000 Jews, and their living standards improved dramatically. Let's Look at the next. You can see Ferenwald here uh, was really a lovely wooded mountain setting. Uh, what really one of the uh, best equipped of the of all the DP camps. 
And uh, let's look at the next one. There you see Eva and her closest friends. The person at the very top is Joe Lubitsky, Martin's brother. But focus instead on the, on the two rows here of these four couples in Ferenwald. They would remain the closest of friends for life. And you can see Eva is the second from the left. Uh, and this is Martin Levitsky here. By the way, look at the difference. They're only in Ferenwald a few months when this picture is taken. I think they look fairly healthy and hopeful. But despite the relatively comfortable conditions, she, Eva, almost every other DP wanted. They yearned for this to be merely a way station, ending within months. The large majority were in their 20s and 30s. All of these people are in their 20s. They longed to start their lives anew elsewhere as soon as they could. Yet American nativism, you know, that's shown so well in Ken Burns' recent documentary, The Holocaust in the US. <clears throat> British colonialism, the onset of the Cold War, the raging conflict in the Middle East, all of these political, geopolitical factors caused most Jewish DPs to remain in Germany until the end of the decade. Eva and her family did not leave until 1949. Most of the camps were not closed until the early 50s. Ferenwald, not until 1957. This interminable suspension between slavery and freedom often felt like a wandering in the wilderness. You know, uh, Bamidbar in Hebrew, and that was the name of the Ferenwald newspaper, Bamidbar. Yet the camps as a whole comprised the most vibrant Jewish community in Europe. The DP experience proved far more purposeful than anyone could have predicted. A needed time out of time to make important life decisions, to come to terms with Jewish identity in the wake of the Shoah, and to prepare practically for the sweeping transformation that lay ahead. Now, with autonomous Jewish camps came dignity. They were essentially run by the DPs themselves, with their own police force, fire brigade, schools, administration. The director, though, was usually an American social worker, often an empathetic Jew who knew some Yiddish. The DPs even had their own law courts, usually a panel of five judges, most with some prior legal experience. They adjudicated cases of theft and assault, bribery and fraud, showing themselves and outsiders that they would not tolerate criminality. Those convicted could be held in a camp jail Known as honor courts, they flew in the face of that early stereotype of DPs as lawless ruffians. At times, they put on trial and punished former capos and Judenrat officials. The, this pursuit of justice was in stark contrast with the very limited denazification taking place in Allied and German courtrooms. The DPs were the first to commemorate the Hurban, literally destruction, as the Holocaust was known then. And with elaborate ceremonies, they commemorated the Holocaust on a collective date of liberation. 
At Bergen-Belsen, they erected a monument to mark the deaths of 30,000 Jews there when it had been a concentration camp. And Jews now drew strength by returning to their roots. To be sure, many had lost their faith, and the majority of the DPs, I would say um, almost all of these except for Eva, the majority of the DPs had been fairly secular even before the war. Part of a younger generation that had been Bundists, socialists, non-religious Zionists, simply assimilationists. Yet even for many of them, Jewish ritual became an important way to break out of the isolation and loneliness and mourn the dead. 75% of the DPs were sole survivors. And there were frequent communal gatherings to recite Kaddish and El Mole Rachamim. Their first Passover carried deep meaning for almost all of them. Rabbi Klausner printed a Haggadah which transposed the Exodus to the recent past, ancient Egypt becoming Germany, the Pharaoh becoming Hitler, the concentration camps replacing the pyramids as the locus of slavery. For the significant Orthodox minority, who preferred the traditional Haggadah, by the way, Life in the DP camps meant kosher food, daily prayers, regular Shabbat services, Torah study, which of course had been denied them for years. Another young American rabbi, not an army chaplain, but rather an emissary from the Orthodox Rescue Committee, Nathan Baruch, bartered whiskey, cigarettes, and coffee on the black market for ink, paper, and binding materials. Let's see the next slide. Over two years, he published almost a quarter million religious books and pamphlets for the DPs on US Army printing presses. And he was instrumental in producing 500 sets of the entire Talmud the title page of each of the 19 volumes, here we have the volume uh, Brachot, of the uh, Survivor's Talmud, or Army Talmud, as it came to be known, depicts a, a Nazi slave labor camp, which you see at the bottom, and then palm trees and other scenes in Israel, the top. Okay, it's, it's a little, the Hebrew there is a little blurred, but it, it, it says, with the support of the United States Army and the Joint. This is published. The Jewish expression through the arts was no less pronounced than religious practice. Almost every camp presented theatrical performances, usually in Yiddish. Stage sets and costumes were primitive. Musical instruments were scarce. The actors were usually amateurs. But these plays helped the DPs shape a narrative of the cataclysm that had just occurred. The hastily written dramas included family separation, endurance in the ghettos and death camps, and armed resistance of the partisans, as well as present day themes, such as the illegal immigration to Palestine, with the British portrayed as Nazis. The audience was boisterous. <clears throat> Some spectators interrupting the play and shouting out in anger or pain in their own dialogue with the actors. <clears throat> Folk songs of the Holocaust frequently accompanied the performances, 
especially the rousing partisan hymn with its last line, Mir seinen do, we are here. Now after a while, the productions became more polished. Classical Yiddish plays were presented. Those of Sholem Alechem and others transported the DPs to the pre-war years of vibrant Jewish life in the cities and shtetls. For even as they looked to the future, the survivors were painfully aware that they were the last bearers of the golden tradition of East European Jewry, the last Yiddish-speaking community on the continent. Most camps had their own orchestras, another feature of the rich cultural landscape. 1948, some of the world's greatest musical celebrities arrived, among them Leonard Bernstein, Benjamin Britten, and San Francisco's Yehudi Menuhin. <clears throat> Although the DPs boycotted his violin recital. Why? Because he had also appeared at the Berlin Philharmonic alongside the former Nazi conductor, Wilhelm Furtwängler. Let's see the next slide. There were educational opportunities, vocational and academic, crafts of all kinds, and above all, sports, including intramural leagues throughout the American and British zones. Soccer was most popular, followed by boxing, gymnastics, and volleyball. Most DP camps publish their own newspaper, filled with world news for which the readers could not be more eager, and incisive opinion pieces uh, on the Jewish future. Let's look at the next one. What would be the language for these weeklies? This is the one from Landsberg. Modern Hebrew had pride of place among the staunchly Zionist DP population, but few could read it. Yiddish was widely understood, but as you know, it's written in Hebrew characters, the typesetting for which was nearly impossible to obtain immediately after the war. So a peculiar hybrid text was born, Yiddish, composed of Roman characters and with Polish spelling. <laughs> now note the, the resourcefulness and adapt, adaptability of these people. So this says uh, the English uh, Ferrat, right? Ferrat is betrayal. This is very early, uh, November 15th, 45, and it refers to the British foreign minister Ernest Bevan, his declaration two days earlier that Britain would not raise its very meager immigration quotas to Palestine. You see how that Lager, Lager is a camp, right? Camp newspaper, Lager Zeitung. But look at the way it's spelled. Now, if the culture in the camps has a common theme, it's one of assertiveness, a shift in Jewish identity from the perceived passivity of prior generations. Nowhere was this more in evidence than in the near total adoption of Zionism, the keystone of the DP's strident political activism. Let's look at the next slide. They held demonstrations in big cities, demanding that Britain allow them entry into Palestine. Now, it's hard to, that sign is not fully visible, but I think what it says is, uh, we demand, wir fordern, freie, I, I think that's Einwanderung, uh, free immigration to Palestine. And the person um, who is under the word veer with a mustache 
That man is Norman Shelob, and he's the, he was a partisan commander, commander of a, of a whole company, and the husband of another one of my co-authors, Mirror Shelob. The, in these demonstrations, they excoriated Prime Minister Clement Attlee. You know, Churchill was mildly sympathetic, but he was unexpectedly defeated right at the end of the war. And Attlee's anti-Semitic foreign minister, Ernest Bevan, they favored the Palestinian Arabs because of their fear of a Saudi oil embargo if Britain were to allow a Jewish state to come into existence. Let's look at the next slide. <clears throat> now this is Eleanor Roosevelt taken around by the uh, a husband of another partisan uh, uh, for whom I co-authored a mem her memoir. This is Isaac Orbuck on the far, on the far right. He is taking Eleanor Roosevelt around the uh, Tsilsheim DP camp. Note his determination, look at his face. Note the body language here. Isaac's son, Paul Orbuck, is here tonight. So there he, you see your father. <clears throat> now, the former first lady was sympathetic, yet not won over yet to the Zionist cause. During this tour, I don't know if it was right after this picture was taken or before, an older woman ran up to her, fell to the ground and touched Mrs. Roosevelt's feet and shouted, Israel, Israel even though the country had not come into existence yet. And uh, she didn't even know if that would be the name finally chosen. Now, even if they were legally barred from making Aliyah, the DPs prepared for Aliyah, learning Hebrew, gaining agricultural skills. Several camps acquired nearby German farmland for kibbutzim. One of them on the former estate of Julius Streicher, one of the most venomous Nazi propagandists. David Ben-Gurion visited in October 1945 and electrified the DPs. 8,000 of them, part of Aliyah Bet, as the illegal immigration was called, would serve in the Israeli army during the War of Independence. They comprise 10% of the IDF. Many DPs who had been anti-Zionist before the war now became Jewish nationalists, including Bundists who had envisioned a semi-autonomous, Yiddish-speaking Jewish community in a socialist Poland, a goal now impossible. It seemed that the Shoah had negated the diaspora, and that the road from destruction to rebirth had to lead to Jewish statehood. Even the ultra-Orthodox Agudat Yisrael movement, which had rejected Zionism, now welcomed it as part of God's plan. Needless to say, uh, bitter rivalries developed within Zionism as each movement sent shlichim, or emissaries, to recruit DPs for aliyah and military service. Most were drawn to labor Zionism's bricha, whose daring efforts included the courageous voyage of the Exodus. But support steadily grew for Menachem Begin's Irgun, already waging an underground war in Palestine against the British. Eventually, almost 60% of the DPs made Aliyah, a much needed population boost for fledgling Israel. And they accounted for one out of every seven Jews there by 1951. 
But even the 25% who immigrated to America, or those who settled elsewhere, tended to be fervid Zionists, held back from Palestine primarily by the bloody conflict there, especially if they had young children. Others were drawn to the West by economic opportunity or relatives who had immigrated before the war. But even they would be stronger supporters of Israel than other Jews. Now, in line with Zionist ideals, male Jewish DPs put a premium on being robust and able to perform manual labor, a clear departure from the paragon of the Talmud scholar hunched over his books. Women came to identify with the strong, independent females who had fought in the partisans or who farmed the fields of kibbutzim that they defended with rifles. Of the DPs who volunteered for the Haganah, Labor Zionism's pre-state army, one third of them were women. But what stands out even more in the camps are the most traditional female roles of all, marriage and motherhood. Let's look at the next slide. <clears throat> Eva's wedding in Ferenwald was a sumptuous, inebriated <laughs> celebration that lasted a whole week because she and Martin Lubitsky were one of four couples who married on the same night under the same chuppah. Hundreds of people attended, all from other camps as well. Let's look at the next slide. <clears throat> Later, Yitzhak Herzog arrived, the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Palestine, the father of Chaim Herzog, a future Israeli president, and grandfather of Isaac Herzog, Israel's current president. Now, Eva's joy like most DP newlyweds, was mixed with melancholy. She had not one relative present. But she thought of the grand occasion in terms of the Jewish people as a whole. A slap in Hitler's face, as she told me. This was felt even more deeply when she gave birth to Moses a year later. Try to imagine, if you can, what it was like for a survivor to bring new life into the world then. So soon, after years of having been stripped of every bit of femininity and told that even if she lived, her body would be so broken that she could never have children. At liberation, Eva was bone thin weighing 65 pounds. 75 years later, on a visit to Auschwitz with 16 members of her family born after the war, she cried out, Hitler, you did not succeed. You left only a tiny remnant, embers, but we raised families and our children raised families. Let's look at the next one. All three women whose memoirs I co-authored had children while they were DPs. The Jewish birth rate in the American zone, over 1,000 a month in 1946 and 1947, was among the highest in the world, with baby carriages seen everywhere. Of all the female DPs of childbearing age, one third was pregnant or nursing. Now, because so few of their parents or grandparents had survived, the new mothers, usually first time mothers, had to nurture their babies in the absence of older relatives. Yet there was a remarkably low infant mortality rate 
because of the near obsession with the well-being of the newborns. Let's look at the next slide. This is a, a book on this subject by the Israeli historian Zev Mankiewicz, and this uh, high birth rate was so impressive to him that he chose to put it on the cover of his book. <clears throat> this is actually a Zionist demonstration in which the women brought baby carriages. <clears throat> now, almost all of this giant crop of Jewish babies was delivered in local hospitals by German doctors and nurses, most of whom had recently served in the Wehrmacht or even the SS. <clears throat> For pregnant Jewish women, this naturally generated fear and revulsion. Many of their memoirs report insensitive, even anti-Semitic medical personnel. Simply hearing the German language in the delivery room was disturbing. In general, their relationship between the DPs and the Germans was one of mutual animosity and resentment. The word historians often use to describe the defeated nation is sullen. Their cities were still full of debris from the Allied bombings. Now they had to absorb millions of ethnic Germans, German refugees, during an occupation in which food and other necessities were strictly rationed. A million or more of their, germ of their uh, uh, women and girls had been raped by the Red Army. Over four million German soldiers had been killed and another three million still held in Soviet POW camps, many not to return until the early 1950s. So much of this vanquished population now wallowed in self-pity. Still brainwashed by the past 12 years of Nazi propaganda, they took out their anger on the foreign Jews in their midst who enjoyed a higher standard of living. They unfairly blamed all the vast black market activity on the DPs. Physical assaults on Jews were uncommon, but contempt was widespread. A wave of Jewish cemetery desecrations spread across Germany in the late 1940s. Now, how did the Jews regard the Germans? Primarily as murderers, or complicit in murder. And the survivor's outrage was further inflamed by the lack of a thorough denazification. This seething hatred, though, had its exceptions. German nannies in DP camps, like the one Eva and Martin hired to help with Moses, often found unsure uh, formed unshakable bonds of trust with Jewish families. Another kind of intimate German-Jewish contact was very different. Single male DPs often went into town and became sexually involved with German women, as happened with two of my co-authors and many other memoirists, including Elie Wiesel, very few of these encounters led to anything serious. It appears rather an outlet for lustful young men who had lost so many years of their youth during the Holocaust, now wanting to make up for lost time. Some openly admit to the thrill of committing Rassenschande, the term for sex between Jews and Aryans, which the Nazis had severely punished. Many of the German women, their husbands or boyfriends dead or languishing in Soviet POW camps, were starved for male companionship at this time, as well as the black market goods that the DP, DPs often brought with them. <clears throat> but by and large, everything German was abhorrent to the DPs. 
they reviled the tiny minority of Jews who plan to remain in West Berlin, Munich, or Frankfurt, remain permanently there, often for economic opportunity. As a leading Zionist put it, Germany reeks of dead bodies, gas chambers, and torture. It is not a place for Jews. But did the DPs avenge the death of their loved ones by engaging in violence against the Germans? Only rarely. Rather, as we've seen, their revenge took the form of marriage, children, and Jewish resurgence. As they witnessed the deprivation of the Germans, many Jews did feel schadenfreude. And this often surfaced in the course of the black market trading that was ubiquitous during the occupation. All six of the survivors whose memoirs I co-authored participated in this illicit activity. And without any feelings of culpability, one justifying it as reparations before there were reparations. <clears throat> now, most of it was small scale, a kind of barter, albeit very one-sided. Because of the stringent rationing of cigarettes imposed by the Allies on a largely addicted German public, tobacco was the gold standard of contraband. A carton of American cigarettes, deeply discounted by the tobacco companies, a carton was available to the GIs for only 70 cents. On the street, its value could be 100 times that amount. Coffee and chocolate, also abundant for the DPs and the GIs, could be traded for gold pieces, and jewelry, watches, cameras, Almost anything that was portable could be concealed. Now, it's true, the biggest heists were usually pulled off not by the DPs, but organized Polish gangs that sometimes unhooked and stole entire freight cars filled with goods. Numerous top allied personnel were also major players sometimes hijacking large shipments of luxury furs in Rosenthal, China. But there were some kingpins among the DPs, including two of my co-authors. One of them sold fleets of ill-gotten automobiles on the black market. Another, with her husband and father, made a fortune in illegal currency trading. She told me, few people have seen five and $10,000 bills, but I have. In both cases, the proceeds provided the capital to invest in lucrative real estate deals once those families immigrated to New York. But the large majority of the DPs who arrived here, even though they dabbled in the black market, came with very limited means. The Lebitskys had only $50 in cash. And like them, most had an unfinished education and lacked fluency in English. And they remained tormented for life. <clears throat> 70 years after the fact, Eva wept as she described her pious father slowly starving to death in the Ludge ghetto despite her heroic efforts to nourish him. And yet she and most other former DPs led fulfilling lives. Those in the US flourished even more than other American Jews. They had a lower rate of criminality and remarkably long lasting marriages. All six I wrote about remain married for life, and that was typical. Overall, they did well economically. There are some phenomenal success stories. One of my co-authors, who survived by hiding in a cave in Ukraine for a year, 
would later own seven hotels in midtown Manhattan. Now, it's also true that some of them fell into poverty, but most, after years of hard work, often menial labor, eventually lived comfortably as middle-class Americans, owning a small business. To give examples from Eva and Martin's story, they had a hard scrabble chicken farm, a bakery, and a dry cleaners. No doubt, the secure and restorative DP camp environment contributed to this remarkable reconstruction of personal lives. But let me conclude by saying that the DP experience was much more a seedbed of regeneration for world Jewry as a whole. I mean, think about it. The saving remnant was the first to confront the momentous challenges following the Shoah, raising families, perpetuating Yiddishkeit, commemorating the six million, and facing the Germans. And the DPs embraced Israel with a fervor seen nowhere else in the diaspora. They were the vanguard of Jewish rebirth, and they proved exemplary role models in the decades to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. Let's give him another round of applause. That was amazing. We, we've actually run out of time, I'm sorry to say, but we will, but Fred is here to take some questions from you as we're mosing around, eating some more food, enjoying the reception, and um, enjoying each other's company. Thank you so much for being here to, um, to inaugurate the Eva and, and Martin Lubitsky Memorial Lecture. And um, thanks again for coming, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.